Hello and welcome to lecture number one, where we'll be talking about the diagnosis and classification, as well as issues pertaining to diversity as it applies to diagnosis. So today's lecture is going to be largely um, somewhat of a history lesson because it's very important to kind of understand where the field was coming from in order to understand where we are today. So why do we need a system for classification of mental disorders? And it's actually a valid question, so why is that important to know? Well, think about the way we communicate with one another. Um, if somebody tells you, for example, I'm feeling depressed, that means something to you. You envision a series of symptoms, which we'll talk about obviously as we go through the course, but you have a picture of what that looks like in your head. And so we use it as a way to communicate with one another. Um, there's been a lot of controversy about classification systems for mental disorders. As you can imagine, um, you know, unlike a lot of other things, mental health is not as concrete. Um, depression looks different from one person to another. It's not something you can touch. There's no blood test for depression necessarily. While they have done, you know, brain scans, and we do know that there are some differences between neurotransmitter levels and areas in the brain that respond. Across the board, there's nothing really other than kind of asking questions and getting information and talking about a series of symptoms that really help us understand what these symptoms are. So in order for us to have kind of a backbone of science so that we can investigate these things and have a better understanding of what they are, how they came to be, and how we can treat them, we have to have a common language in science. And so I think this is a kind of an apropos quote. A science can only develop as far as it is able to classify the information in its field. And so why we, we do that is that so that we can have a way of understanding a common language and a construct to assess. And thus, having diagnosis helps us communicate with one another in our profession, uh, helps us share information with our patients, it helps us understand for research purposes, and also in terms of treatment, like how we can proceed given a certain diagnosis. There are also disadvantages of a classification system, particularly when it comes to, to mental illness, because when we talk about somebody as being depressed or somebody as having borderline personality disorder, we sometimes lose individual information. And as we talked about, you know, for example, borderline personality disorders has nine different diagnostic um, criteria of which you only need to have five to make a diagnosis. So there's a lot of permutations and combinations. But you also learn, as we'll learn about today, you lose issues related to diversity and individualism and culture. And so, you know, just by saying somebody has borderline, while it gives you a picture, it does, it takes away from, you know, some of that individual. Like if you say somebody has schizophrenia, you fail to recognize sometimes that the individual is a son or a father or a mother. And, and it, you kind of just see the person for the disease and you lose their individualism. Um, there's also potential for abuse because when somebody um, receives a label, then you know there can be issues that, that come across. For example, now there's a big debate in the country about gun rights for those with mental illness. So now if you've been labeled with a mental illness and you have a diagnosis, um, you know, are you now forbidden to, from having a gun? You know, that's obviously another debate for another time, but I'm just saying like because of this label that a person has, that can prevent them from having certain rights. Um, and so it could sometimes also be detrimental to the client or client care. For example, you know, we fail to see the person as a person anymore, and therefore we see them largely as a diagnosis. Um, you know, you, you can see that in the field of, with, with for example, autism, um, now that they've kind of, extended it. You see people getting diagnosed with autism who are functioning relatively well, but when you hear um, that they have this diagnosis, you have a certain kind of picture in your mind, and it, sometimes it can limit the potential that you see for that individual, whereas if they didn't have a diagnosis, you wouldn't necessarily see those limitations. So in psychology and psychiatry, our Bible, quote unquote, is the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. This is where we, in North America, um, get our diagnostic information. And this is the book that you purchased for this class. We're currently in our fifth version. So 
The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders is still a relatively new book. It was first published in 1952 by the American Psychiatric Association. So this is not something that we as psychologists control. It is published by the APA, but the what they call the big APA, um, as opposed to our APA, the American Psychological Association. It's the American Psychiatric Association, Association so it's a medical book. Um, it was developed from an earlier classification system in 1918. Um, where the, the Federal Bureau of Census needed information on how to categorize people in mental hospitals, and so they developed you know, a basic classification system, which was then refined by the American Psychiatric Association. It also um, was based on systems that were used in the military, um, and they also surveyed about 10% of those numbers of the American Psychiatric Association, and they compiled a book. If you ever have a chance to kind of go back and look at this first book, it's actually very, very interesting how much you know, diagnosis has changed and how, how short a time. I mean, it makes you recognize how new our field really is. Um, it's very small compared to the big tome that you now have for this course. So, you know, your, your book is hundreds of pages. The first manual was 130 pages long and contained 106 um, categories of mental disorder. The next version, the DSM-2, was published in 68, so 14 years later. It now had 182 disorders, so you can see this is exponentially growing. Only slightly longer, um, at 134 pages. But the, the DSM-1 and 2 kind of reflect a very kind of, um, I want to say old-fashioned, but that's not necessarily how it is, but a more psychodynamic view of diagnosis. It was based on Freudian concepts. They defined mental disorders in terms of defense mechanisms and other kind of Freudian concepts. And if you think about it, like how do you measure a defense mechanism? Um, and so people who were not dynamic in nature really found these books hard to use and hard to apply to their client populations. So we didn't have a lot of specific symptoms that were detailed or um, we couldn't, you know, concretize those symptoms and measure them. And so if you've ever took a course in the measurement of or the construction of tests and an item, you want things have to be measurable and you want to have good inter-rater reliability. And that was very poor for, for diagnoses in DSM-1 and 2, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of a classification system. Um, now, it also made the boundary between normality and abnormality unclear. Now, that's again debatable um, as to whether there really should be a strict boundary or whether it should be a continuum, but there wasn't a clear um, definition of what when something becomes a disorder. Um, I just wanted to show you this video here. He probably um, read or heard about the, the article being um, in being sane in insane places. This is the seminal study by David Rosenhan um, where he sent um, students into uh, a psychiatric or individuals into a psychiatric hospital um, and they got admitted and so these are a few of his words. A different kind of criticism. Very human and very unhappy. My apologies, we'll start again. A different kind of criticism, but one that's just as provocative, has been leveled by David Rosenhan of Stanford University. Between 1969 and 1972, a group of colleagues and I gained admission to psychiatric hospitals by simulating, by faking, a single symptom, which was that we said that we heard voices, and the voices said, empty, dull, thud. The moment we were admitted to the hospital, we abandoned our symptom, and we behaved the way we usually behave. The question was, would anyone detect that we were sane? The answer was, no. No one ever did admitted with the diagnosis in the main of paranoid schizophrenia, 
we were discharged with the diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia in remission. Now, in remission doesn't mean quite the same thing as sane. The term we use to describe the experience is dehumanized. Nobody talks to you. Nobody has any contact with you. The average contact of patients with staff was about six and a half minutes a day. Nobody comes to visit. The first time I was in a psychiatric hospital, on an admissions ward with 41 men, my wife constituted four of the seven visitors on a weekend. Psychiatric hospitals are storehouses for people in society whom you really don't want, whom you really don't understand, and for whom you've lost a great deal of sympathy. Staff need constantly to be reminded, and it's very hard to remind them. They are, after all, doing their best on the front end, but they need constantly to be reminded that the people who are their charges are not merely collections of symptoms. They are people with spouses, with children, with parents, with jobs, with mortgages and bills to pay, that they are, in the fullest sense of the word, very human and very unhappy. So it's very powerful, this study that Rosenham set out to do. So he really wanted to talk about the subjectivity of diagnoses made with the DSM. And so he and, and some of his students and colleagues went to a psychiatric hospital in Pennsylvania and complained that they, they heard words, the words empty, thud, and hollow. They reported no other symptoms, um, but they were immediately diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. So over the next three years, um, seven of his students and colleagues repeated this exercise in 11 other hospitals. And on average, they were medicated and held in psychiatric hospitals between eight and 52 days. And um, he documented these experiences in some of his, his written work. And so if you're interested, um, uh, I, can show, I can send you the article that he wrote. But he claimed that based on these experiences, psychiatrists had no valid way of diagnosing um, mental illness. So... Um, as a follow-up to this, once this was published, a research and teaching hospital challenged Rosenhan to repeat this exercise. Um, and so his, the staff at this hospital were warned that at least one pseudo patient might attempt admission. And during that time where they were, they were warned um, that somebody might try to come in as a fake patient, 43% of those admissions were believed to be an actor by at least one staff member. Interestingly enough, no actors were sent. So that kind of shows you that people um, often really don't have a good sense of who is and who is not mentally ill. Big changes kind of came for the DSM in 1974 with the decision to make a new revision. Um, and Robert Spitzer was selected as the chairman of this task force. So he was chaired with the DSM-3 and DSM-3R. He was based out of um, Columbia University, New York Psychiatric Institute here in New York City. And um, he was really seminal in kind of viewing the way of, of um, psychiatric diagnoses, the way we view them today. He passed away last year, but he was really kind of, um, you know, seminal in this field. And so he and his group wanted to make the DSM nomenclature consistent with the International Statistic Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, the ICD, you've probably heard this book, which is published by the World Health Organization. The rest of the world uses the ICD for diagnoses here in the, in the United States and generally in Canada as well. We still use the DSM, but internationally, the I, ICD, which is published by the World Health Organization, um, is the manual that is used. So you should um, also gain some familiarity with this. That's also available online. So the revisions of the DSM took on a very wide mandate under Spitzer, and he made a committee of different members to look at different areas of diagnosis. Um, if you're interested, you can Google this, or um, I can send you the link. There's an article in the New Yorker um, about Robert Spitzer and his contribution to the di uh, to diagnosis. 
So one of the goals of the new DSM-3 was to improve the reliability of psychiatric diagnosis, as I mentioned um, with the previous versions, because they didn't use very concrete symptoms it was very hard to have good intraoral reliability. And so we were not seeing uniform practices across health professionals. And so it was very important to establish specific uh, criteria that were objective and measurable in order that we could facilitate communication among mental health professionals and mental health research so we could advance the field in our understanding. The multi-axial system, um, this was the five-axis system, was developed to get a more complete picture of the patient. So this was in response to the fact that people were viewing diagnosis as unidimensional. So if we looked at these five axes, which we'll discuss momentarily, um, you got a, more, a better understanding of how an individual function. So axis one was uh, major mental health disorders. Axis two was personality disorders and mental retardation. Axis three, was other mental health problems. Axis 4 was problems in the psychological environment and difficulties functioning. And Axis 5 was the global assessment of functioning, which was a number of 1 to 100 to kind of assess where the individual was. So um, the criteria and classification system was based on a process of consultation of committee members. So they got um, people who were top in the field from around the world, and they brought them together. And they, you know, they did this consultation and they, they came up with these, these symptoms of the diagnosis. And so they wanted to make these categorizations based on sign symptoms and natural history rather than these psychodynamic assumptions of underlying causes. So we really wanted to see um, that these were measurable and district contacts. Um, so let's, the, the, the criteria um, for the major mental health disorders were expanded. Um, from the research diagnostic criteria and the Fager criteria, which were developed for psychiatry research in the 1970s. And then other criteria for the DSM-3 were established in consensus with other committee meetings. And so um, this approach, which some call the Chinese menu approach, like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, um, which obviously is, is not very politically correct these days, but um, is kind of seen as a neo um model, so after the, the psychiatrist Neil Kraepelin. But basically, it was almost the opposite of what DSM-1 and 2 were, because they were based on psychodynamic theory. So this approach was said to be atheoretical, and people criticized it for the like. And so the, the, new draft, the first draft of the DSM-3 um, was prepared within a year. It was a huge undertaking. They introduced many new character, uh, character, sorry, categories of disorders. And then they had field trials where they kind of tested these out. Um, and the NIMH sponsored this, the National Institute of Mental Health. And these field trials were conducted between 77 and 79 to test the reliability of these new diagnoses, which obviously in designing any new met system of diagnosis would be very important to see if this is actually you know, reliable and valid out in the field. And it was very controversial to delete the concept of neurosis, which was seminal kind of in, in one and two and at a key point of psychodynamic psychotherapy. Um, and, you know, you'd see historically a lot of people were diagnosed with neurosis, but they felt this was very vague and scientific. And so they took this out. Um, but, you know, there's a kind of a, 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 like a, 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 almost an argument, I guess, between those who viewed the world more psychodynamically and behaviorism, which was also kind of emerging in the 50s and 60s, who were kind of against views of the world this way. So there was a lot of political opposition, and there was actually danger of the DSM-3 not getting approved by the APA Board of Trustees unless neurosis was included in some capacity. Um, they actually reinserted the term in parentheses after the word disorder in some cases. So while there was an effort to remove it, um, as you see, it's not just based on science. There are also politics involved, and so neurosis was brought back in. So in 1980, the DSM-3 was published at 494 pages long, so it's now four times as long as the previous versions. It now has 265 diagnostic categories, so 100, 100 categories were added. Um, it came into widespread international use by multiple stakeholders, including insurance companies, um, which can be controversial because in order to get reimbursed, people had to have a diagnosis. And so they were using this book for, for diagnostic purposes. But it really has been termed a revolution or transformation in psychiatry because 
this was the first time that a lot of these things were objective and we had a common language that was used among all people. You know, we had special criteria sets, decisions and rules, operalization and blueprints. And so that's been continued into the use of the DSM-5 today. In 87, they published the DSM-3R, which was a revision of the DSM-3. It was also under the direction of Spitzer. Um, certain categories were renamed um, and reorganized, and there were six significant changes in criteria. There were six categories that were deleted, um, while others were added. So controversial diagnoses such as premenstrual dysphoric disorder and masochistic personality disorder were considered and discarded. Um, ironically, now that we in the DSM-5 actually have added the premenstrual dysphoric disorder, um, so the DSM-3R now contained 292 diagnoses and 567 pages in length. So you can see this, this book is great at gaining in size. Um, it also makes you wonder, you know, how subjective a lot of this stuff is. I mean, we went from having very few diagnoses to now having, um, you know, so many. And, and all of a sudden, this is over a period of 30 years, the field has changed so dramatically. So in 94, uh, the DSM-4 was published, now has 297 disorders, 886 pages. Um, this uh, task force was chaired by Alan Francis, which had a steering committee of 27 people. Um, and for the first time, there included four psychologists, because previously psychology had been excluded from the conversation. So there were 13 working groups of 5 to 16 members each, and they had uh, 20 advisors. So this is now a huge operation, getting a lot of stakeholders involved. So each of the working groups conducted a three-step process. First, they conducted an extensive literature review on the diagnosis that they were investigating. They got data from researchers conducting tests to determine which criteria required change. Um, and then they also conducted field trials using multiple centers, so not just one place, but across you know, the nation and globally as well, because we want to make sure that this is not just an artifact of one place in time, that this was happening kind of more universally, and we want to reestablish the viability of these diagnoses and clinical practice. So um, just like in the DSM-3, DSM there was really an emphasis on empiricism as particularly focused on the reliability and making this useful for clinicians, which was ultimately the goal to begin with, right? We wanted a common language that we could share with one another. So another major change from previous versions was the inclusion of the clinical significance criteria. You've probably seen this. Um, so each symptom, each diagnosis, you, you may have all the symptoms, but unless they cause a clinical significant um, change in people's ability to work or function, it would not be considered to be a psychiatric diagnosis. For example, like you can have a fear of spiders, but if this is not impacting your ability to function or work, this would not be considered a psychiatric or psychological diagnosis. Um, the DSM-4 also added an appendix for culturally bound symptoms. So there are some mental illnesses or syndromes that are only recognized in certain cultures. So this is the criteria for clinical significance. So clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. So without that criteria, you could not have a psychological or psychiatric diagnosis. A text revision of the DSM-4, um, known as the DSM-4-TR, was published in 2000. And it was largely the same thing. There was just um, a few um, text changes, hence known as the text revision, gave some additional information, and some of the diagnostic codes were updated in order to have consistency with the ICD, which was that international diagnostic book that I mentioned to you. Some of the problems that were highlighted with the DSM-4 is there was frequent comorbidity, like you'll see a large degree of overlap between many, many disorders, such as anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. There was an increased use of the term NOS, um, so that's not otherwise specified. Um, and so it didn't have any particular criteria. So if people kind of felt that there was like, you know, kind of it looked like a duck and smelled like a duck, even though it didn't have the, the characteristics of a duck, they could now kind of label it a duck. Um, so if it looked like depression, but you didn't meet all five criteria, you could give somebody a depression NOS, which would then, you know, get you insurance reimbursement. And there was also a lack of support for the, uh, the categorical classification scheme, so like kind of this all or nothing. 
And so we know that, you know, people don't, it's not like if you suddenly have five symptoms of depression, you're depressed, and when you have four, you don't have impairment. It's more like it's on a continuum. So they were finding that with the NOS diagnosis, up to one fourth of all adults got this diagnosis. And so like there were people were referring to this as kind of a garbage diagnosis. And you'll see, especially in the forensic world, um, I work with sex offenders and you'll see in the civil commitment proceedings where people have to have a diagnosis in order to be civilly committed, um, the, you see a lot of, you know, uh, NOS diagnosis because there there's you know people want they need to have a diagnosis in order to civilly commit them so what you guys have now is the DSM-5 um, that was published in 2013 by the APA um, it's been you know controversial and kind of slow to to break ground but that's what we're using now it's somewhat of a moderate alteration or modest alteration in the DSM-4 still a categorical classification system it was supposed to be more revolutionary they were talking about it being a continuum ultimately that's not what came to be um, and there was a lot of controversy with who was and was not included and so they used the categories as prototypes um, and they they felt that patients who had close approximations to those prototypes would be considered to have that diagnosis. Um, kind of in a parallel way of, of kind of changing things, NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, um, developed what's called the research domain criteria. So there was, you know, an ongoing concern as we we're getting more and more research in, in a lot of these diagnoses that these categorical, sim these categorical ways of diagnosing really don't apply. And so what the NIMH did was it developed what's called this RDOX initiative. And it's meant to free scientists from designing research based on traditional diagnoses. For example, before, if I wanted funding for the NIMH, I would say I'm doing a study of anxiety or a specific, you know, social anxiety disorder, which meant a specific sort of um, symptom presentation. But now what they're doing is they're encouraging individuals to explore groupings based on genes, behavioral presentations, physiological traits or brain imaging findings. So they've really gone more to the biological aspect of, of, of um, behavior. It's very hard now to get any funding for mental health research from NIMH without including biological measures um, of like neurotransmitters, brain imaging, things like that. And so they feel that by including these kinds of criteria and having more homogenous subjects that we're studying will have improved um, treatments that are being developed. So as I said, NIMH no longer funds studies of diagnostic criteria, but we must rather look at understanding causes and consequences of domains of construct. So the biological basis of um, auditory or visual perceptions and functioning and things like that. And so um, the process, the development of the DSM-5, which is what you're doing today, um, started in 1999. Um, in 2000, like with an evaluation of the strengths and weaknesses of the DSM-4. So in 2007, um, the, two, uh, the DSM-5 task force was, was approved. Um, it consisted of 28 members, including a chair and vice chair, Cooper and, and Regier, who are kind of um, psychiatrists who were making, you know, who do a lot of research on understanding the causes and consequences of mental illness. Um, and they represent scientists from psychiatry mostly, but as well as other disciplines and clinical care providers. And this time they actually included consumers, meaning, um, you know, those diagnosed with mental health issues and family advocates as well and as part of their task forces. So similar to previous um, ways of developing, they got diagnostic work groups, they reviewed literature, they got research. Um, they recommended changes. They conducted multi-center field trials to look at the utility and reliability of diagnosis. They also then posted um, a call for pub the public and professionals to review drafts of what they'd done and to provide feedback both in 2010 and 2011. Um, there were a lot of criticisms of the process. Um, some people viewed the DSM to be too pharmacological, so anybody who had links to the pharmaceutical industry was potentially um, excluded from being on the task force. So actually Spitzer, 
and many of his colleagues were not able to be on the task force, and he was, as you remember, the person who was seminal in developing the DSM. Um, it was too secret, the APA enforced non-disclosures agreement, agreements making the entire process secret, which I don't understand why that would be the case. One would probably want to have as much input. Um, and it was too exclusive, so it was only the world-renowned scientists um, that were on, that were chairing these work groups, and they felt like it was not inclusive enough. So, in terms of the changes and what you see now from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5, it's better coordinated with the ICD-11, which is the latest um, version of the ICD, so that there's better communication internationally. Um, there's been clamor kind of here in the U.S. to just get rid of the DSM altogether and just use the ICD, since that's what the rest of the world utilizes, but um, it's not necessarily taken traction. Part of the reason may be that the, D, uh, the APA gets a lot of its funding from selling this uh, diagnostic manual um, is one rumor. I don't know how true that is. Um, it also is reflecting more developmental perspectives, both across and within categories. So um, we're seeing the diagnoses that manifest um, early on in life, like neurodevelopmental disorders, appear before those that develop later in life. So you'll see things like, you know, childhood disorders, autism spectrum disorders kind of put first in the book and things that come on later in life, like depression and anxiety um, that are, are coming later on in the book. And it also reflects more of a dimensional um, approach. So we're seeing kind of the internalizing uh, symptoms such as anxiety, depression, somatic symptoms, appear first within those disorders that manifest in adolescence and then externalizing kind of disorders that appear afterwards in the book. So why she would be coordinated with the ICD, as I mentioned, I think the more that we can have in common and the more that we can communicate, you know, globally about these things, the better it will be. I mean, we don't want research that's only North America centric. We want to have, you know, because obviously we are a culture and a community where people come from all over the world. So um, just to compare them, so ICD is pr produced by the, the, uh, the World Health Organization of the United Nations. The DSM is produced by the American Psychiatric Association. The ICD is free. Um, as I mentioned, the DSM is produced by the APA and they generate revenue based on it. Um, the, the use of the ICD is, is for countries to get statistics on mental health issues as well as for frontline service providers. The DSM is primarily for psychiatrists and insurance companies. The ICD is more global. Um, the DSM is, is primarily US-based and Anglophone. The ICD was approved by the World Health Assembly. Um, the DSM is approved by, approved by the APA Board of Trustees. The ICD covers both mental and physical health conditions. Um, the DSM is only mental health conditions. And the ICD is currently the required diagnostic system by HIPAA and the US federal government where the DSM is not required. So my sense is that within your lifetime, we're not gonna be using the DSM anymore, but we still primarily use it in psychology. The other big change is that they dropped the multi-axial system. I'm still not quite sure how I feel about this. I mean, I grew up with the multi-axial system, so you know, I'm, it's hard for me to change, but we don't have that anymore. So disorders that would have been listed separately on axis one, two, and three are now simply listed as independent diagnoses. So axis four material, which were environmental psychosocial problems that may have affected um, diagnosis and treatment are now listed as um, ICD-5 codes. And then the global assessment of functioning, which was the axis five, is now optional. Although um, we can administer the World Health Organization disability schedule um, as well, and there's a link for it. You can Google it, obviously, online. So as I mentioned, the AXO system was dropped. So before, this is what, was, what it looked like under DSM-4. So James Jones would be a major depressive disorder and alcohol dependence on AXIS-1. If you had a personality disorder, you would uh, antisocial, you'd label that on AXIS-2. He also had cirrhosis of the liver, which is a medical condition, which we would label in, in axis three. Axis four would be any psychosocial or environmental problems that he had, so he has relationship problems with his spouse. And axis five was the global assessment of functioning on a one to 100 scale, and these were broken down in 10 point criteria. So here he got a 60. So as you can see, um, this 
I found this relatively useful. They felt like this was no longer useful. And so now in DSM-5, this is what it would look like. James Jones has major depression, alcohol use disorder. Here's the kind of the continuum spectrum because we label it as severe. He also has ASPD, cirrhosis of the liver, and relationship problems, and that's the ICD code. There's no NOS anymore. Um, instead, we indicate the severity of the disorder as mild, moderate, and severe, or we can use other specified, and then we would have to explain um, why the person didn't meet the criteria. For example, the episode was short or there were insufficient sy symptoms. Although I'm now seeing other specified replacing NOS, although at least we have a little bit more information now. Or we can use the classification unspecified if there's insufficient information or they choose not to make a diagnosis for a variety of reasons. So we're also seeing that as well instead of NOS. There remain to be concerns with the DSM-5. As you can imagine, there's never consensus among anybody in our field. Um, so it still remains a product of historical precedent. Um, and the, who is on the committee? There's, you know, politics involved in my field. You know, duh, there was a lot of controversy about whether we should include hebophilia, which is those who have attraction to adolescents. And there were people that, you know, said they should include it. Other people that said they absolutely should not include it. Ultimately, it ended up being not included. And it still is very culturally specific. So it's very much um, bound in North American culture. Um, there's continuing debate about construct validity and reliability. Um, even though significant efforts have been made to standardize the criteria and get better inter-rated reliability and controlled research. Um, they feel that stating that the DSM is empirically sound or founded in empiricism is, is somewhat overstated and that we still don't have a good understanding of the pathology or cause of many disorders, which then undermines the construct in, in to begin with. Um, and so we still have the whole categorical versus dimensional argument. Um, when I taught this course 10 years ago and they were talking about the DSM-5, we were almost certain it was going to come out as dimensional. Um, it was kind of a shock to many of us since this was top secret that it still um, did. So, you know, you think about like, you know, for example, the continuum of social anxiety disorder. We have people who are very shy. At what point does it become a disorder? Um, you know, where are we labeling that? Sometimes it feels like, arbitrary lines in the sand are being drawn. Um, they, they feel, a lot of people feel that having a fully dimensional spectrum would better represent the evidence that we have in the field, that these are not distinct categories, that these are really continuums of symptoms. Um, so why should we have a dimensional approach? This way we don't lose information. So people who have, you know, kind of four and a half symptoms don't get the disorder, but people who have five do. Um, and it also, you know, in terms of behavioral purposes, it helps for treatment. Um, it reduces diagnostic overshadowing so that, you know, when we then have a fuller understanding of symptom presentation. And you could also then highlight people's strengths as well as their, their weaknesses would actually improve validity because we know, as I mentioned, it's not an all or nothing for many of these things, that these things exist on a, on a continuum. And we see that there's a lot of similar underlying pathology for many of these disorders. For example, if you have a family member with bipolar disorder, their relatives can then exhibit symptoms of depression, schizophrenia, or bipolar disorder themselves. So there seems to be some underlying genetic component that, that is shared among many of these disorders. It also is argued that having purely symptom-based diagnostic criteria fail to take into account um, the context in with a, which a person is living or whether it's simply a response um, to kind of an ongoing situation like a bereavement um, or just, you know, challenging life situation. You know, your child just has cancer. Obviously, you're going to develop a lot of anxiety. Um, and so, you know, you don't want to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder when there are life events that kind of can explain those, those symptoms. And using the distress and disability um, to, for many disorders, didn't solve the problem of false positives because we don't specify the level of impairment. So, you know, obviously, again, if your child, for example, has been diagnosed with cancer, your ability to function is going to be impaired, but does that mean you have a psychological diagnosis? Um, it's not clear.
there's still a lot of political controversy. Um, so because of, there's a lot of, um, you know, people who take money from insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies, they feel like these companies have undue influence over what these um, diagnoses came to be. And they argue that the expansion of some of the diagnosis, like premenstrual dysphoric disorder, for example, is just a ploy by the pharmaceutical industry to now have a diagnostic criteria so they can prescribe more medication to women. Um, so just remember that the, the DSM-5 is really a psychiatric textbook to present um, kind of a common language for us to use, but it can also be thought of as a diagnosis textbook, so it kind of talks about how we can think about these disorders. It's a living document, so this is not the final version of it. This is going to change in your lifetime, but it's kind of the best of what we have right now. It's giving us an understanding of trying to understand the validity of these diagnoses. So one important issue that we're going to be highlighting throughout this course, and I want you to think about throughout your career, is how diversity and culture impact diagnosis. Because, you know, we are each individual based on our sexual, our gender, our sexuality, our gender, our race, our ethnicity, our culture, our religion, our age, and all these factors influence how um, symptoms are presented across the lifespan, across the world. And we want to be understanding these things um, in, in those contexts. So always take into account those issues. One thing that's been very controversial has been homosexuality. Um, so homosexuality used to be a diagnostic criteria in, a D, in the DSM. And it was included in the DSM-2. Um, sorry, the, the DSM-2 didn't list homosexuality as a diagnostic category. Um, Robert Spitzer, who was involved in the DSM-2, um, they organized a vote and they confirmed that they would eliminate homosexuality um, as a diagnostic um, category, but they would change it to sexual orientation disturbance. So that somebody who, for example, was gay or straight and didn't like that could be considered to have a sexual orientation disturbance, but not surely by being um, a homosexual, would you be labeled as having a psychological diagnosis? Um, there was a lot of controversy with this. This is um, Robert Spitzer who's kind of talking about this decision here. The DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's a publication of the American Psychiatric Association and it's kind of the Bible of psychiatry. I came up with a definition in 1973 that made it possible to argue that homosexuality was not a mental disorder. I mean, the gay activists have taken the viewpoint that from a political strategic point of view, they do better if they can convince society at large that once you're homosexual, you can never change. And I can appreciate that that helps them politically, and I'm sympathetic towards their political goals, but I think it's just not true. So this was kind of um, an old perspective, and he, uh, Robert Spitzer at the time, believed that homosexuality could change and actually published an article um, indicating that there, there were treatments to change people's sexual orientation. He later recanted and was very apologetic and kind of has highlighted this was one of the big mistakes in his career. So um, homosexuality was, pla was replaced then in the DSM-3 with ego dystonic homosexuality, um, which was then removed in 87 with the DSM-3R. So ego dystonic homosexuality would be if somebody was, sex, was, was homosexual but was unhappy about that. So as recently as the DSM-4, a category of sexual disorder not otherwise specified was included, which could include persistent and marked distress about one's sexual orientation, but we have removed this for the DSM-5, although 
transgender individuals may still be diagnosed with gender dysphoria. And so we have to be very careful about pathologizing things that are culturally bound. For example, you know, in many cultures, homosexuality can still be viewed negatively. And it's not necessarily that the person feels bad about their, their sexual orientation, but rather the, the, the viewpoints of the culture in which they live. So there have been a lot of criticisms directed at the DSM with regards to cultural issues because it's really lacked a lot of cross-cultural assessment and diagnosis. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, we see over-representation of um, marginalized groups, for example, um, poor individuals and um, ethnic minorities tend to be diagnosed with schizophrenia at higher rates than um, more affluent um, or um, weight individuals. So we see a lot of overdiagnosis, underdiagnosis, and misdiagnosis um, from underrepresented and marginalized groups. It's just, um, which is obviously there's a problem there. And a lot of people, you know, kind of question who defines what abnormal is um, and, you know, what what does this mean when it's pertaining to other cultures? You know, for example, certain religious groups um, believe that you can be possessed by spirits or that you hear voices or in the um, Native American tradition, you know, you have spirit encounters where you see things. So, you know, according to our DSM, that would be, you know, hallucinations. So would that person that have schizophrenia, but this is really, you know, viewed very appropriately within the culture. So DSM-5 offers two tools for assessing cultural features in the context of an individual's illness. Um, so there's kind of guidelines for cultural formulation, which calls for clinicians to assess people's backgrounds and reference groups when looking at these symptoms, possible cultural explanation for clients' issues, and cultural components that may affect the client counselor relationship. So for example, I once interviewed somebody who belonged to um, a religion where people would become possessed by spirits during the service. Um, the spirits would enter the body, people would become possessed, and people would very strongly believe this. But within the context of their religion, this was very normal. Um, it's not normal within my religion or my cultural um, perspective, but I understood it within that individual's perspective, and, and therefore it was not labeled um, as any kind of, you know, for example, psychotic symptom, where it would be if I was just, you know, to the, the norm which I was referring to, it would be considered to be strange. But within their culture, it was considered to be perfectly normal. You also want to look at components that may affect the way that the client interacts with you, be that socioeconomic status, gender, ethnicity, language, culture, you know, that people are coming from and how that may impact their ability to kind of share information with you and your ability to get information from them. New to the DSM-5, um, on page 752 of the DSM-5, is the cultural formulation interview, which is a semi-structured interview that can kind of help you obtain inf information about the impact that culture may have on somebody's presentation and care. On page 833, it also presents a number of cultural concepts um, of distress or syndromes, which are only recognizable within specific societies or cultures so that you would be aware of these when, when working with your patients. So now that you know about the history of the DSM, um, are classifications in psychopathology splendid fictions, compelling notions, austere formulas devised to give coherence to their inherently imprecise subjects? Um, and so these are questions that you are, I leave you with. I don't think we have any good answers. Sometimes these things give us more questions than answers, but I think these are very important questions to have as you go forth. As I said, in your lifetime, these things are still going to change. And we want as much to, as possible for, cult, for research to inform these decisions that we 